Welcome to Professionalism and Customer Service in the Health Environment, Key Elements of Effective Communication. This is Lecture C, Using Media for Communication. The objectives for this lecture, Using Media for Communication, are to discuss communication in both paper-based and electronic formats, to discuss personal communication in the work setting, to understand the importance of listening skills, and finally, to understand the role of diversity in communication. One of the more common paper-based communications you will be expected to generate is the business letter. When writing a business letter, first you need to identify and know your audience. This will greatly influence the content of the message. For instance, if you were writing to inform someone that the order entry system needed to be down for installation of a database patch, you might be very specific if writing to a database administrator. Conversely, if you were writing to a clinician, you would focus on how the change will affect that clinician and not go into detail on the technical steps. Be concise, to the point, informative, and brief. In today's healthcare environment, declining reimbursement rates, coupled with more patients, create a scarcity of time for clinicians. You want your communication to be concise and content-rich so that information can be imparted as efficiently as possible. Use of bullet points greatly helps in this by making your points obvious to the reader. There are various conventions that surround the writing of a business letter. For example, do not write a letter or email as if you are texting. While use of texting conventions like LOL are wholly appropriate for teens tweeting their friends, it will not endear anyone to you in a professional setting, and you will likely be ignored and discounted. Each paragraph should discuss only one topic. The writing needs to be easy to refer to later. And if you keep the paragraphs topical, you will make this much easier for the reader. Ensure that your spelling and punctuation are correct. Remember that your letter can become documental evidence, so do not write anything inappropriate. Letters can and do get copied and forwarded. So write it so you will not regret it being forwarded beyond original recipients. If you have time and you feel uncertain about your letter, ask a coworker to review it for you. Now let's look at the do's and don'ts of email communications. This slide lists the do items. Do use correct grammar and punctuation. Provide context as needed to frame your message and specify why you are sending the email. In other words, say what the purpose is of the email. Be clear in the email when you need a response. Write a meaningful subject line to increase the chance of the receiver opening the email. If a new topic is being discussed, even if you use an old email to find the sender's address, it is good to make the subject line match the new topic rather than leaving the old subject line in there. It is often helpful to include a screenshot or flow diagram when imparting complex information about systems. When doing so, be careful to use a commonly accepted format, such as a PDF or a .doc file. Always write the email as if the recipient may not be able to open the attachment. That is, put much of the relevant information in the body of the email. A very common use of a screenshot might be to take a picture of an error code to send to the developer, or take a picture of the particular order screen and annotate which fields are going to change with a new version of an order entry system. Finally, when you receive emails, always try to provide a prompt response. As an HIT professional, it is likely you will receive many, many emails per day. You will need to prioritize your correspondence based on the author and subject. This is yet another reason your subject lines need to be concise and clear. This slide presents a list of email don'ts. 
Don't use company emails for personal use. Company emails are saved by employers. It can also be easy to accidentally address personal emails to the wrong recipient and, depending on the content, can create quite an embarrassing situation. Do not include needless graphics in an email message. The recipient's email client may not be able to display the message. When you do use graphics, use common formats that can be read without any special software. PDFs and doc files as attachments are usually safe. But don't assume, for instance, that your recipient has Visio installed on their machine for display of process flows. Do not send off emotionally charged response emails. Email can be a difficult medium to discern tone and emotion. And as a result, your recipient can easily take a strongly worded statement personally and send a retaliatory response. When you receive charged emails, and you will, if possible, try to hold off for 24 hours before you respond. Waiting will allow you to cool down and respond with objectivity. Also, consider setting up a face-to-face -face meeting with the sender. Clinicians will sometimes project an adversarial tone in an email when they are really only venting over frustration with change. Talking with them after sufficient cooling off time will more times than not result in a less emotionally charged discussion and a path forward. Do not use background colors or borders. Do not use emoticons such as smiley faces or characters made with the colon and parentheses. Many view this as being childlike or unprofessional. Use of CC can be very helpful when wanting another party to know the status of a project and or situation, but be careful. If you consistently CC someone on minor and unrelated content, you may quickly find that those recipients prioritize your email lower than you want. Now let's see if you can critique this email message. What did Barry do right? We can see that Barry was professional and polite in his tone and language, that he used a descriptive subject line, and that he provided his full contact information in case Dr. Winston needed to talk with him. It is also helpful to add a click here link in addition to the URL. This makes it easier for the recipient to find the information, and you will likely get higher responses when you do so. Now let's critique this email message. What did Barry do wrong? The textured background makes it difficult to read the email message. Also, Barry's tone and language are more suited to personal communication with friends rather than a professional situation. Barry's opinion of the online learning modules was negative and not helpful. The negativity was added to by the emoticons. He neglected to provide Dr. Winston with any contact information other than his email address. Additionally, he neglected to refer to Dr. Winston as doctor. Dropping titles should only be done after being informed to do so. It will be necessary for you to maintain a record of electronic communications like email. One approach to this is to separate your inbox into distinct folders. For example, emails could be sorted by project, by functional area, or by dates. The advantage of this system is that you can more quickly find existing emails. Also consider using your email client's flag function to indicate which emails require a quick response. That way you can sort through your inbox and note which messages have priority. Do not delete emails until absolutely necessary. Often you will be the keeper of contracts and project communication. It is not unheard of to be requested to produce timelines on communication several years after the fact. If you have not archived and kept these messages, this will be difficult, if not impossible. In addition, you should archive your emails periodically to improve performance of your email system. 
For phone and other real-time communications, make sure you use the caller's name in the conversation. Restate or rephrase key points made by the caller, as this can validate the caller and confirm that you understand the message. Don't mumble. You need to speak clearly because you want to be understood. Whenever you call someone else, it is a good practice to ask, is now a good time to discuss this? This sends the message that you value the caller's time and are not assuming that your time is more valuable than theirs. In many clinical settings, a corporate paging system is the most effective way to reach clinicians. Use may depend on your institutional policies, but be judicious when paging clinical staff. For text paging, it is helpful to include a phrase like, when you get a chance, please call 51212, and the like. You want the page to acknowledge that the recipient may be taking care of patients and have more pressing clinical responsibilities at that moment. If you have anything in your mouth such as food, gum, or a tongue piercing, you may be difficult to understand. Avoid harsh negative language in the conversation, even if you are receiving it from the caller. You can be firm and assertive without resorting to harsh language. Avoid direct arguments with the caller. Instead, offer to schedule a time to meet and discuss the issue later in person. Finally, listen intently to what the caller is saying and note the tone. Unless the call uses a live video of the caller, you are unable to ascertain body language cues. So, do your best to listen intently. Oftentimes working in HIT, you may find yourself taking calls in support of some type of implementation. These events are all-hands-on-deck type of situations, and regardless of your normal role, you may be taking calls during a go-live. The callers will be stressed and probably not in the best of moods. Being cheerful and attentive will help move the conversation in a positive direction and assist in getting the clinicians comfortable with the changes they are experiencing. Occasionally, you may be tempted to make personal phone calls while at work. However, it is very important that you minimize or eliminate personal cell phone calls while you are working. In addition, responding to personal text messages should be kept to a minimum. It's a good idea to turn off your cell phone's ring function and use vibrate or a silent option for your personal devices while at work. Do not have an offensive ringtone. Imagine the embarrassment if you were having a meeting with executives and a coworker were to call your phone with the ringtone of Beck's loser. Not only would it interrupt the conversation, but the people there would wonder what ringtones you had for them. It is best to have your interactions with personal friends and loved ones during a defined break period or lunch. Most healthcare information technology professional positions require significant communication. Communication occurs between and within departments, as well as with outside suppliers and or users of the services provided. For many people, daily communication involves live in-person or face-to-face -face communications, live phone communications, and or receiving or leaving recorded messages. So you can see that we all have plenty of opportunities to use our voices each day. The tone of our voice, or how we say the message, affects how we are perceived by others, positively or negatively. Take, for example, the phrase, Wow, you are really getting good with that order entry screen. Depending on which tone is used, this phrase can either be supportive and encouraging or sarcastic and condescending. Be cognizant of the tone you use. Condescension is not going to work well at all when you are working with other professionals in a healthcare setting. Nordhaus and Nordhaus describe a study by Morabian who identified that for face to face communication, the tone of voice accounted for a significant part of how a person is perceived. Other measures included the words used and nonverbal behavior. If you are making a professional presentation, 
there are some things you can do to improve your voice. These include breathing from your diaphragm, smiling as appropriate, drinking water, and avoiding caffeine and dairy products before making the presentation. In short, remember when your mother told you, don't talk to me in that tone of voice? Well, she was right. Instead, talk softly, calmly, and confidently, and you will be more effective. In order for you to become a good communicator, you must develop strong listening skills. Listening provides the message receiver an opportunity to more fully understand the message. An added benefit is that focusing on the message provides an implicit signal to the speaker that you care about what is being communicated. By practicing it, you are adding validation to the conversation and helping to obtain understanding of the speaker. There are a number of components associated with being an effective listener. These areas are often discussed in professional and lay publications and even on blogs on the Internet. Focusing on the message sender entails removing distractions as much as possible. This can include turning off your cell phone, muting your office phone, and not using your computer. Monitoring your computer or laptop or smartphone during a face-to-face -face conversation is considered rude or disrespectful at best. Another way to improve your focus is to physically remove yourself from your distractions and have the conversation in a quiet, neutral space. To further enhance your understanding of the conversation, note-taking is appropriate. Note-taking serves a number of purposes. Besides the obvious purpose, to understand the message, note-taking serves as a signal that you are interested in what the message sender is saying and confirms that the sender is important to you. In the practice of healthcare, it is very useful to document next steps and takeaways that come from the many conversations you will have in your career. Also, your listening skills will improve when you summarize the conversation as it is happening. Finally, note-taking reduces your talking, which leads to increased understanding. If you don't feel you understand what has been said, you can ask for clarification or confirm your understanding. It is very appropriate to rephrase or restate what the person has said. This serves to solidify your understanding and reduce ambiguity. In HIT, ambiguity can be costly, resulting in development of incongruent solutions or acquisition of systems that will not work as intended. Something as simple as restatements of understandings can greatly reduce this problem. If you are able to observe the person, you can observe the message sender's body language for congruence with the words used. You may note that the sender's facial expression tone of voice, gaze, or type and intensity of gestures used are not aligned with the spoken words. These can serve as flags for multiple messages. Additionally, watch for changes in nonverbal cues during a conversation. These can point to items that are emotionally charged or conversational points that are or are not associated with negative emotion. For example, Imagine you were at a vendor demonstration with one of your cardiologists, and every time the vendor discussed a new measurement tool in the software, the physician rolled his eyes. You may want to make note and ask the cardiologist later what their thoughts are on that aspect and how important it is for care delivery. Try to remove personal bias based on prior contact with the message sender or others' opinions of him or her. Additionally, avoid preconceived opinions that may be based on sexual preference, religion, age, gender, favorite sports teams, or culture. In terms of the use of assistive technology, if you have permission, in some circumstances, it can help to record the conversation through the use of special pens that function as digital recorders. An added benefit of some of these pens is that you can touch your handwritten notes with the tip of the pen and the conversation from when you made the notes will replay. This is a real time saver and an aid to communication. 
Do not expect cultural similarity in communication. Diversity or culture-influenced communication can be challenging. One approach is to learn the cultural communication norms of individuals that you communicate with and perhaps to modify your communication style or approach to address differences. Additionally, make note of the tone, formality, and language used in their messages to you. Aim to use a similar formality. Similarly, you may find that certain responses to questions may be related to cultural norms associated with the messenger's position or place in the organizational hierarchy. Be alert to cues that the receiver may not have understood your message and rephrase it if necessary. Also, though, remember that while it is true that verbal and nonverbal communication can appear to be culturally driven, there are variations among persons in all cultures. Humor can be an effective way to diffuse a situation and can be extremely useful. One must take care in its use, however. You want to avoid offending anyone. Use humor about situations, not about people or groups of people. Also, mild, self-deprecating expressions can be a useful tool in diffusing tense situations. For example, if you were trying to explain a process to some clinicians at a meeting and were getting blank stares indicating that they were totally lost, a good response might be to say something like, I'm sorry. I think I'm coming across as a total propeller head. Let me try a different approach. Again, things can be taken out of context, so be careful. If in doubt, do not use humor. This concludes key elements of effective communication. In summary, we reviewed the common elements of communication, the importance of verbal and nonverbal communication, and the use of personal communication devices in the work setting. We examined listening skills. We looked at how diversity affects communications, and we recommended that humor be used with caution in the workplace.